Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, my first event since the pandemic, and such a great way to come out of it. So artificial intelligence is the most powerful force of our time. We've seen such impressive gains over the last few years. Now we are at the realm of language understanding having models so large that they can produce coherent pieces of text. We are now looking to building intelligent robots, both in the air and on the ground. And we are looking towards solving hard scientific problems, such as discovering new drugs, and ultimately problems that are greatly beneficial to humanity. What has led to this progress is an impressive growth in model complexity. It's mind-boggling to think that the models have grown 30,000 times over the last five years, and it's doubling every two months. This is highly impressive. What has led to this explosive growth is what I call the trinity of AI. We have deep neural network algorithms being powered by large-scale data sets and the computing infrastructure, especially the parallelism of NVIDIA GPUs. So this synergy of data algorithms and compute has led to this explosive growth of AI over the last decade. So the question is, where do we go next? Is this all what we need or do we need to be much more mindful of the new algorithms we design? And to answer that, what we really need is to go for generalizable AI. Right now, most of AI is very narrow. It's trained for usually one task. On the other hand, that's not how our brain works. You just heard Daniel Kahneman talk about slow thinking. No, we have pretty good instincts, but so much of what we do doesn't just rely on that. We also have the system, too, where we slow down. You know, we look at all the facts, and then we reason about that. And what drives this is also interactive learning. We are always like testing the environments. You see infants touching things, trying to walk, trying to look at everyone. That interaction is so critical to build this bridge from learning to reasoning. And that is what we need to build in our AI systems for broad generalization, for robustness so that it can work in the real world and so that it can go to entirely unseen scenarios and make new discoveries. And one critical aspect of this slow thinking is the availability of feedback. In our brain, we are not just taking in external signals, such as from the retina, but we also have an internal model where there is feedback. And this feedback is slower than just the feed-forward mechanism. And this, in totality, creates visual perception. And so if we abstract these kind of concepts, such as feedback, we can build now neural networks that are not just a composition of feed-forward layers, but have an internal generative model and drive feedback to create more robust learning and also be able to learn just few examples like humans do. And so this kind of inspiration in terms of how our intelligence is grounded in feedback can be greatly beneficial to creating better deep neural networks. The other important aspect is embodiment. Like I said, interaction is so critical for our learning. And so to do that, we need to create robots that are intelligent. So you see this impressive Atlas robot, Boston Dynamics robot, that can do an impressive backflip. But what is more lovable and what is more intelligent? It's the dog, right? So even though it may fumble, it may fail, it's learning, you know, it's taking our commands, it's always adapting. And that kind of intelligence is still far from what the robots can do. And so how do we enable robot learning? 
At NVIDIA, we built the platform called Isaac that can have physically valid simulations accelerated by GPUs. And with this, we can now try all kinds of different experiments, right? You can do treadmill in different speeds, and we can also build primitives and learn how to mix with reinforcement learning. And with this, with the multitask setting, we can now test the robot in entirely unseen scenarios. This baseline with no learning is going to fall on this proverbial banana peel with no friction, but the learned robot is more robust. And also, we can transfer it to the real world, to the real robot, and in you know, show robustness and have different tasks be done in the real world as well. So this notion of going from simulation to the real world can enable embodied AI. And that requires not just the design of new environments, but also new algorithms with a notion of hierarchical learning to enable, finally, robust real-world deployment. The other important aspect is safety. You know, we don't want our drones to crash, right? We want it to be intelligent and adaptive. So this drone here is tracking trajectory very close to the ground. And this is enabled by learning the aerodynamics in a data-driven manner. Or we can also try to handle high wind speed, you know, potentially very unsafe for a standard drone, but with now learning, you can handle even these challenging scenarios. And that's where we can harness the power of learning while maintaining safety guarantees for these challenging scenarios. And indeed, we can ask, how do we solve hard scientific problems of our times? From tackling climate change to understanding the fundamental properties of our molecules and atoms. What is the role of AI here? So one aspect we've looked in the last year is to design neural networks that can learn complex systems, such as those described by partial differential equations. And this requires us to think beyond standard neural networks that learn only in finite dimensions, meaning they expect, say, images of a fixed size. On the other hand, when we are solving these complex systems, we have a continuous function, right? We should be able to handle all kinds of resolution, all kinds of different grids. And so we need a versatile framework for handling such scenarios. And we created one called Neural Operator. And what it's able to do is learn complex fluid flows. You can see it here. Uh, be able to evaluate in higher resolutions than it's trained on. So it's cheap to train, and it's 1,000 times faster than the standard solvers. And that's where you see the power of AI in being able to learn complex systems and be able to generalize seamlessly while being much faster than traditional methods. We've also seen that with quantum chemistry. Indeed, the primary equation is the Schrodinger's equation. If we can solve this, we've solved everything, right? But even to do that on a small molecule with about 100 atoms, it would take more than the age of the universe to run on today's supercomputers. So how do we build AI methods that can do good approximations and get us accurate quantum level properties? So we combined molecular orbitals, these you can think as domain-specific features, with graph neural networks, which are versatile and flexible. And by doing this careful combination, what we achieved was the ability to train just on small molecules and directly evaluate on much larger molecules. So this transferability allows us to study important properties for drugs, such as geometry optimization and do that again 1,000 times faster than the current methods. So in conclusion, what I talk today is to move from just learning to reasoning. And that's what will enable generalizable AI. And for this, we need feedback. We need a generative model and the ability to combine that to make predictions effectively. 
AI for science is the future of science. And AI has shown already promising results with enormous speed ups as well as good generalization. Thank you.